All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Lindy Berg, and I am the Towner County Extension Agent, and I'm here with Naeem Kelwar, who is our Extension Area Specialist for Soil Health out of the Langdon Research Extension Center. And what we wanted to do was give a um, demonstration update for the Towner County Saline Sodic um, demonstration site um, south of town, um, about six miles south of Candu. Um, we've been doing this since I think 2015. So um, I think it's due for a little update. And so that's what we're doing today. Okay, so here is the first soil sample that we did back in 2016 in May. And as you can see, um, this area was from a visual standpoint, um, very saline um, area. We didn't really know a whole lot about what kind of acidicity we had here, but um, so we decided we wanted to do a demo plot for the Towner County Crop Improvement. And so we came out here to soil sample. And this was back when we had to soil sample by hand. I say we, but Naeem had to soil sample by hand. Um, and so what we did is we made a three acre plot out of this. So the first acre we did, uh, we applied gypsum as an amendment and then um, the second one we did beet lime and then the third one we didn't apply any amendments we just planted the grass mix so out of all three of these we planted salt tolerant grass mix um, on top of the amendment. So the amendments we applied in 2016 and for gypsum we had eight tons um, eight tons of gypsum and then we had 16 tons of lime applied um, and then just for a side note for the differences, because um, they're both salts, um, gypsum is a calcium sulfate and lime is a calcium carbonate. We can kind of talk about that in a little bit um, more because a lot of people have that um, comment that they bring up, like we're applying salts, we're trying to get rid of salts, how does that work? So we'll kind of talk about that a little bit too. Okay, so here's just some pictures of, um, evolving our soil sampling into a truck, uh, which Naeem was super excited about. You can see back in um, 17, we were still doing it by hand. I keep saying we, Naeem <laughs> was doing it by hand. Um, and then we got um, this pickup. So in 1819, and so this pickup with the soil probe, it goes down four feet. And then here's a picture or a video of um, the probe in action, I guess you could say, let me play this. All right, there we go. Um, so these are the grasses that we planted the summer of 2017. And we'll talk about this a little bit too, a little later um, in the presentation. Um, and well, I mean, right now, I guess Naeem, you can talk about these grasses if you want to. We have a comparison chart that we'll talk about later in the presentation um, as far as forages and crops and um, where these grasses fit into that and their tolerability, I guess, with um, the saline sodic levels, but these are the grass types that we um, planted with um, in those three acres. So um, do you have anything you want to add name as far as, you know, why we chose these grasses? Obviously they're saline tolerant, but. The basic thing is that um, these grasses are, they're more salt tolerant than almost all of the annual crops that we could have grow on these areas in North Dakota. So they will grow, they will provide the vegetation. So that's the major benefit of that. Uh, one thing I wanna point out that at the time when we planted this mix, uh, we included intermediate wheatgrass. Uh, lately, we have replaced that with the Western wheatgrass. Um, and 
western wheatgrass is much more salt tolerant than intermediate wheatgrass and it's deep rooted. Um, so here is fall. So again, we planted this the summer of 2017. Here's the fall of 2017. So we're just starting to see some of the bunch grasses coming up. Uh, this is where you do need to be a little patient. Um, it's easy to go out there and get very frustrated because you're like, why is nothing coming? Um, but it, it does come, it just takes, takes some time. Like anything else with soils, it just takes time. Um, so here's in 2018. Um, so it has the different plots here where the gypsum was applied, the beet lime to control. And you can see that the grass is coming in very nicely. Um, and then you can see what it looks like in 2018 when um, it was hayed. So it was turned out very well, even in that short. I mean, to me, that was kind of a short amount of time um, that I was expecting. So, um, so here's 2019, early spring. Um, again, what the grasses look like um, in 2019. And you'll see um, in the soil samples in our um, results, we're soil sampling these every year. We try to do it about the same time every year. So here's July. Um, now one thing you'll notice in July is <laughs> we didn't really get to the weed control <laughs> as much as we did um, in the previous years. So um, one thing that we'll talk about too is management of these um, grass areas, whether you decide to cut them or mow them or whatever you want to do, um, it's important to do that. Okay, so here we have the soil analysis. Um, and I'll let Naeem kind of discuss this back from the 2016 um, sample that we took before the amendment application and then um, after. So in 2016, we basically took one composite sample, uh, which was four feet deep. Uh, and you saw our picture using the handheld auger. And that sample essentially represented the whole demonstration site. At that time, we didn't separate these, uh, the site into three different plots because we were essentially not sure about the sodicity. We could see the white cell crest. We knew that there's salinity issue, but we were not sure whether there would be sodicity combined with that or if there would be, whether there would be high enough for us to have a demonstration site because we wanted to apply these amendments to see uh, what these amendments will do. So we took that sample. And if you look at the results, um, soil EC, and this, this is saturated soil EC, both SAR um, EC, as well as PHR analyzer saturated paste method. You can see that yes, the, the site has uh, a high EC of 5.85. Uh, say for sensitive crops like corn, soybean, but it's not that high uh, compared to the sodicity levels, which are represented by SAR here. SAR is close to 25. Uh, that is way higher than um, the EC of 5.85. So I would rather uh, label this site as more sodic than saline. If you look at again, go back to the pictures, it was like a snowstorm, whereas it was the middle of summer and the salts were blowing. So you would think that the salt levels were very high, but it was the opposite. It was a sodicity, which was very high. Bear in mind that um, until 2016, the weather was very wet. There was a lot of precipitation we were getting, and that would mean that, um, you know, rainwater access can and has created shallow groundwater depth and brought all these um, excess salts and sodium into the topsoil. But we also need some water to force or push these salts back into the deeper depths. In my view, that was the reason we had lower salt levels compared to sodicity. Now in 17, we separated this site into three acres. Um, and on one acre, like Lindy mentioned, we applied gypsum, another acre, we applied beet lime, and then control, and then we planted the grass mix. This was the first year when we actually took separate soil samples, again, four feet deep, from each 
plot. So you could say that the 2016 soil results don't really represent the individual plots. They may represent the entire site, but they don't really um, represent the individual um, results of the um, these treatments. Now, if you look at the 2017 results, um, salt levels are obviously very high uh, compared to 2016, and the sodicity level also went down. Again, if you look back at the weather trends, 17 was the first year when the weather started getting quite dry, and this site was almost bare. There was nothing growing because we the perennial salt-tolerant grass mix we planted, uh, we planted in 17, and around 18, it started getting established. But 17 is still, there was a lot of evaporation going on. And in my view, the dry weather was the main reason. It could, there could be many more reasons, but I think that the dry weather in 17 was the reason there were high levels of um, uh, salts as well as uh, sodicity. And this is the same trend we see this year because of our last fall was very dry, spring has been very dry, and we see these white areas very prominent. Now, if you look at the 2018 results, um, yes, there were some fluctuation in the salt and sodicity levels, uh, especially for example, um, you look at the soil sodicity or SAR levels of beet lime in controlled plots, they went down a little bit, um, 18, we got a little bit more rain and overall precipitation compared to 17, but we were still not close to 16, for example. And also I would like to attribute some of the, um, some of the lower salt levels to um, the grass mix because we planted this grass mix in 17. And by the time we went back to take samples in July of 2018, I think these grasses combined with weeds, we may not like weeds, but you know, on sites like this, these weeds, as long as we manage them, as long as we don't let them go to seed um, and then create issues for us in the future, if you um, manage them by either mowing, grazing, or haying, you reduce evaporation. And when you reduce evaporation, there would be less wicking up of groundwater into the top soil, and that means less salts and sodium will come into the top soil. So I, I would think that uh, I would like to give some credit to this grass mix there. I don't think we were seeing any um, uh, effects of amendments, but the grasses were showing us some uh, good effects. 19. If you look at the 19 results compared to 18, they're very similar, I would say. And so was the weather. Now, in 2019 fall, we got a lot of rainfall suddenly. Earlier part of the part of the year was quite dry, very similar to 17 and 18. But it's starting around end of July until September, it was very wet. But because we took the samples in June, we didn't really saw that kind of effect on salt or sodicity levels. So levels were very similar to 18. And again, grasses were quite established, um, you know, keeping in view the high salt and sodicity level of that site, they were quite um, established. So we saw some benefits there. I think we can probably point out too that when we take these samples, it's in the two worst spots of each plot. So, yeah. Um, yeah. With that in mind, we didn't have, it took any GPS points, you know. So, bear in mind that, and soils were very, like, even if you are within a couple feet, you'll still get sometimes very different results. Uh, so, that is true, Lindy. And if you look at our 2020 results, um, there again, um, the major differences I see here that the salt levels actually decreased in beet lime and control plots. Gypsum, they roughly remain the same. And then sodicity levels actually increased in gypsum plots. Um, beet lime, they were roughly the same and control, they, uh, went down a little bit. 
Again, I would like to give some credit to these grasses. Uh, somehow grass stands were very good in control in beetline plots compared to say gypsum plots. So if you have a better stand, that would mean that there would be less evaporation plus better stand above the ground means there would be more root growth below the ground. And those roots, even if you have high sodicity levels, that means soil layers are very dense, your soil water infiltration is very slow, but by virtue of having these plant roots, they can provide these channels for the rainwater to move through and that rainwater can then push the salts into the deeper depths. So this is, this is I think, is another clear um, a positive effect we saw uh, of these grasses growing there potentially no annual crop will survive. Now I'm just gonna quickly show you the average soil EC, SCR and pH levels for the four feet um, depth for all three plants. Um, so the year, which was 2017, when we started taking separate soil samples from each treatment or plot, um, if you just look at the EC and SCR um, um, analysis along with say pH, roughly, there were some annual fluctuations, but if you look at the average of four years, they roughly look the same. I wanna point out one thing. Um, sodicity makes the soil layers dense. High salinity levels compete with plant tours for water. In order to leach the salts, we need low enough groundwater depth and um, we need decent water and good soil water infiltration. Since sodicity effects the soil water infiltration negatively, you could see that if we have high SCR levels in a certain soil depth, that correlates to um, soil high soil EC levels as well. Because when we have dense soil layers, water cannot really move. That means salts are also gonna accumulate instead of going into the deeper depths. And that is evident from the first 12 inches of all three samples. All right, so this is um, something else Naeem did um, at the Langdon Research Center um, through the barley and oat trial, which is very, very interesting. Um, this was back in Blade well, Planted, the trial on June 1st, um, last year, 2020. Um, and he applied 120 pounds of N per acre here. And there's three different um, trials. There's a, a low saline sodic site, a medium, saline sodic site and then a high saline sodic site, um, comparing those three with barley and oats. And so here's the varieties of um, the barley and the oats. So there's three replications, um, again, the low moderate, moderate to high, and then the very high salinity um, with sodicity levels. Is there anything else you wanna to add to that? No, I think um, you explained it very good. So like Lindy said, we had three different levels of salinity and sodicity. And we actually took composite samples from each replication or level. So the replication one represented low to moderate. When I say low to moderate, it would be low, say when it comes to uh, crops like barley and oats. Moderate would be say sensitive crops like um, say corn, for example. So the surface, zero to six inch soil EC, which is again saturated paste EC, was 3.99 with an SAR of 7.12. Um, and this could, would be quite high for crops like soybean, but for barley and oats, um, it was, we considered it low to moderate. Six to 24 inch EC and SAR levels were much higher compared to uh, the first six inches. And we planted this trial on June 1st, and I took these pictures on June 11th. So on the left-hand side um, on the screen, you see all four barley varieties. On the right-hand side, it was oat varieties. And you could see that um, there is some germination there. And now in the next uh, slide, you're gonna see that the surface, um, this slide, by the way, is from the same replication. 
And uh, it's just, I took the picture uh, on July 16, and you could see that there is very decent growth of barley and oat varieties, all four. One thing I want to point out that it's very essential, what is the salt and sodicity level in the first six inches? Because that's where we plant the seed in the first inch or two. And since in this replication, our salt and sodicity levels were low enough for barley and oats in the first six inches, we had very good germination. But the question which came to our mind was that what's going on in the six to 24 inch depth? So we pulled up some plants and I realized that these plants were keeping their roots shallow in the first six inches in order to survive, not going into the high salt and sodicity levels in the six to 24 inch depth. And we got some very decent uh, yields. So the bottom line is plants also try to adopt, but if your salt and sodicity levels are very high, even in the first six inches, like for example, what we're gonna see on the next slide. So right here, uh, this is, uh, we considered it moderately high salinity and sodicity levels. So here, the difference is that even in the first six inches, EC is more than seven, close to eight, and with an SCR of 18, which is quite high. And six to 24 inch EC and SCR levels are even higher than that. So here on June 11th, I didn't see any germination. And on Ju July 16th, if you see, you could guess what happened to the stands and what happened to the yields. So in this uh, uh, replication, we lost 75% of barley yields across all varieties and 65% across the variety yield reduction for oats. Um, and that's because of our surface salinity and sodicity levels were high. And the very last replication, which had very high levels of surface salinity and sodicity, as well as the subsurface, uh, barley, all four varieties, didn't even germinate until the end when we harvested the trial. Oats, there were some, some germination um, here and there, um, and I could say there was a variety ND heart, which yielded five bushels per acre, which obviously is not economically feasible, but you could say that at these EC and SAR levels, that was, that was a, I was impressed. Let's put it this way. So this is, I asked Naeem, I was like, well, do we have anything as a visual that we can compare? Um, cause I'm a visual person. I like to see, um, see everything um, compared side by side. So I kind of put these together with this help of, you know, the forages and crops in there, um, what levels they can grow at basically. So, you know, you know, for barley, what is, where is the point where, you know, I can grow barley or I can't grow barley? Um, what does the EC level need to be at? And so this is something we put together. So I guess, don't take this. This is not like an easy black and white um, situation, I guess I could say. Um, so kind of take this, I want to say, take it with a, take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, but we also have the, the graph of the irrigation water quality. So your non-saline, saline, medium, high, very high. So what does that look like? What does your EC levels look like? And then when you're comparing your forages and then your crops. So I don't know, do you wanna add anything to this of you know, how variable are, or um, some of them are even more than 14, I would say. Yes, yes. Uh, one to one EC, some of the perennial salt tolerant grasses, uh, and this is, uh, this is what I've seen in publications, can tolerate up to 26 EC. Again, one to one. And um, so that is very high. Uh, I don't know of any annual crop which could tolerate that high level of salt. But like Lindy said, this is, you know, bear in mind that soils are different. Salt types are different. Say for example, um, sodium chloride salt may cause toxicity to more toxicity to some crops compared to say calcium sulfate, for example. Uh, so there are lots of factors which go in um, when it comes to salinity. Um, so just, just use this as a rough guideline. These are not, like she said, 
this is not black and white. And then here, um, I just kind of added in what that trial was for the barley and oats. So you can just kind of see where the low, the moderate and the high and kind of where those are within this um, slide. Um, so our takeaways for this first um, portion here is that although barley and oats are probably the most salt tolerant crops, the salt tolerant grasses that we talked about, those can tolerate even higher level of salts. Um, planting the barley and oats um, may require more of an investment input cost versus the grasses and then resulting barley and oat yields may not justify that um, potentially. And then the grasses um, are only require the seed purchasing potentially 30, 35 an acre. Is that still pretty accurate, name that 30, 35? I mean, mostly uh, prices are subject to change, but this is just again, a rough guideline. Uh, but yeah. I would say that we should be, we should, we should be okay. As long as we use seven to eight pounds of uh, grass seed per acre, we should be good around $35, $40 per acre at most. And then, you know, we kind of talk about how to utilize that grass to, um, to kind of maximize your production. Um, and then poor barley and oat stands, of course, in the initial years um, are not going to provide a good vegetative cover. And that's something that we, we want. And the grasses um, did very well. Um, even though we're applying the amendments, there will still be high groundwater level issues um, from the road ditches, which need to be taken care of. Um, and a good grass stand will use up some of that ex um, excessive moisture there. Um, do you want to talk about this a little bit as far as the different barley varieties? Yeah, we found that um, six row barley varieties and we had tradition in that uh, mix, um, it outperformed. Uh, the, all three other three two-row barley varieties on low to moderate as well as moderate to high levels of salinity and sodicity. Very high levels, no barley varieties germinated, but tradition, which was a six-row, outyielded um, the other three uh, two-row barley varieties. So it depends where you're planting your barley. If you're planting these barley uh, crops on good land, then I would assume, and this is what I've heard from our research people, that, for example, Genesis will out yield tradition. But when you're looking at these troublous spots, you, if you just are focusing on yield, uh, unless you're getting premium for your quality somewhere else, um, your six row barley uh, varieties are going to do better on these kind of uh, spots. And then also we found out barley was a still, even if you planted two row barley varieties, um, barley was a still a much more salt tolerant crop than say wheat under dry land field condition or the saline sodic condition. I would like to also emphasize one big learning lesson for me as well as quite a few people I would assume uh, from this trial was that oats came out as if they are not more salt and tolerant than barley, they, they're equally tolerant. So if economics makes sense for you, um, oats would be another very good option. And then late maturing varieties are more salt tolerant than early maturing varieties. And then um, here's, here's why we, we are presenting this topic uh, and you will see in our infiltration demo um, results. Wet weather, which say some people say the cycle is started in 1992. Some I've heard saying 1993. I wasn't here, but it has started somewhere there. It brought a lot of water close to the surface uh, in, in shape of shallow groundwater depths. But we need more water right now to force uh, these salts into the deeper depths. If we want to apply the amendments, dry weather is not going to help that either. And I'll give you an example. For example, the Langdon and Donny station recorded uh, close to 25 inches of rain in 2016 from April to October. 17, it was close to 10 and a half or 11 for the same time period. So we went from 25 to 11, say. We need to re remain somewhere in the middle. So say, I don't know exact number, but 18, 19 inches would be perfect. For example, that will provide enough moisture for the crops to grow as well as 
we have we will have low enough groundwater depths there will be enough water for the amendments to get dissolved and push or force the salts into deeper depths having said that intensity and quality also matters because if we got two inches in two hours there would be mostly runoff we don't want that we want slow and steady rain with a decent interval for example not just getting rain every day then soils will become saturated and they will not infiltrate more water and that's not going to help us either it will actually again create runoff erosion and it'll just go into the ditch and then wick back when the soils are dry so we need a combination of low enough groundwater depth um, and which we normally have right now because of the dry weather where groundwater depths have lowered, but we do, we do not have enough quality water, which can not only dissolve the soil amendments, but it could then force the salts and the sodium into the deeper depths. Just to clarify, when we apply amendments, for example, um, gypsum, which is calcium sulfate with two molecules of water, rainwater separates calcium from sulfate. And that calcium will displace a sodium uh, from the soil, clay, and negative particle, uh, humus negative particle charges, then sodium comes into the soil water as a free ion, or it could also convert into a salt, and then it's water soluble. It could leach out. Right. So basically, what we're saying is that you know when we add in the beginning, I said you know we're we're adding salt <laughs> to a salt problem, um, but what happens is that sodium you add that calcium, it, it um, transforms that sodium into a salt that we are able to flush out, basically. So, so just to clarify, calcium sulfate is also a salt. When we add that to take care of sodicity, and sodicity is not caused by sodium, which is present in the salt. So by applying a salt, we convert sodicity into a salinity issue. Right. And then we look up to the sky to get some more rain. Okay, so this is the second section of this presentation. We did an infiltration demo on November 5th and 6th, and we wanted to see how the different soils will lower the salt and sodicity levels with and without amendments, um, if extra water is added. So we wanted to simulate rainwater by adding um, water to our soil samples. So out of the 2020 soil samples, the leftover samples, um, we took that and we added 500 mils of water to each sample. And so the soil samples and the drained water were analyzed for EC, SAR, and pH through the saturated paste method. Um, and then they were all analyzed for texture. And I'll let Naeem kind of explain that a little bit more. But you can see the chart at the bottom where they're color coded. So you can see which ones are the gypsum sites, the beat lime, and the control. So essentially we took... Uh... 2020 leftover samples, which were first sent to the lab. And we showed you the ECSAR and pH um, analysis earlier uh, to you uh, in this PowerPoint. So we, we got the leftover samples from the lab. We didn't use all four depths. We only wanted to use the zero to 12 and 12 to 24 inch soil depths of um, all three plots. And then we added 500 milliliter milliliter of deionized water to each sample. So deionized water means there are no salts, nothing, it's just pure water. And our whole objective by doing that was that we applied the amendments. However, we didn't really see a decrease in soil SER. And for that matter, EC, there were some annual fluctuations, but there was not a, a major decrease. And we believe that was because of the dry weather. We didn't have enough water for these amendments to get dissolved and create the desired uh, chemical reaction. So we just took the leftover soil samples and we pounded this water on top of these samples. So before we go and show you the results, we quickly wanna differentiate soil salinity uh, from soil sodicity because these two are often confused together. Uh, a lot of people consider soil sodicity as a sodium uh, excess a sodium salt. So salinity is caused by sodium, and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, excess water soluble salts. And salts are a combination 
of chemical ions, such as sodium chloride, which is stable salt. There are positively charged ions in the soils, like um, say sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and there are negatively charged ions like chloride, sulfate, carbonate, bicarbonate. Any of these ions can attract each other with their positive and negative charges, and they could form a salt. Some salts are more soluble than the others. For example, chloride-based salts would be the most soluble salts, followed by sulfate. Uh, Carbonate-based salts would be the least soluble salts. But salts are a combination of chemical ions. So density is caused by sodium, which is attracted soil clay or humus particles. And those clay and humus particles start breaking away from the aggregates or soil chunks, and that leads to dense soil layers. Now, this is why sodicity is not caused by sodium, which is present as a salt, because if a sodium is attracted to a negatively charged ion, its positive charge would be neutralized by that chemical ion, and it cannot attract a clay or humus particle. It is true, though, that if we have high levels of water-soluble salts that are sodium-based, there's a constant exchange going on between soil water and soil particle negative charges. Yes, more sodium ions can get saturated or attracted to soil clay and humus particles, but as long as um, sodium is present as a salt, it will not cause sodicity, it will cause salinity. So here are the results, the differences between soil EC. Um, and you could see that we use three samples, control, gypsum, and beet lime. And the soil depths uh, we use were 0 to 12 inch and 12 to 24. Except one sample, by adding that water and doing nothing else, there was a decrease in soil EC, which ranged from 60 to 90%. That was very significant. So you could see the blue uh, bars are represented by the soil EC before infiltration. So that's the actual soil EC of 2020 sample, say for example, for control, gypsum and beet lime plots for zero to 12 and 12 to 24 inch depths. The red one, red numbers represent soil EC after infiltration. So we sent these samples after infiltrating the water to the lab and we got EC, SER, and pH analyze. And then on top of it, we also got the water, which drained from these samples, analyzed for EC, SER, and pH. And you could see that the initial EC 2020, say for example, I'm just gonna take an example of control zero to 12 inch depth, 6.7, it, it re got reduced to 2.67, and it's reflected by a very high EC in the water. Remember, this water was deionized water, pure water. No salts uh, were in that water before that. Now, if you look, the main decrease would be in the first 12 inches. It doesn't matter whether it was control plots or gypsum plots or beet line plots, and that's because the soil is structure, soil amendments were there. And you will see um, in the slide of SAR, the major decrease was in the first 12 inches because amendments take time to move through the soil depths. Uh, and we use depth separately. So gypsum samples, especially the first 12 inches, had the highest decrease in SA, uh, EC levels followed by beet lime and control. Now there was one exception, these 12 to 24 inch uh, depth beet lime sample. There was hardly any reduction in soil EC. What was the reason? Let me guess. The main reason I could think of that that sample drained in 24 minutes. It drained 500 milliliter of water in 24 minutes compared to the next fastest sample, which drained 500 milliliter of water in 255 minutes. And this could be an error um, caused by me, for example, because when I was putting the soil in that slender, if there was some air pocket or there was some gap from the side of the slender, which led to that faster infiltration, 
I could only think of that kind of example. I, I don't really exactly have a scientific answer, but I could, this could be outlier. Now, if you look at the SAR before and after infiltration, this again proves one point that amendments are effective as long as we have enough water to dissolve those amendments. So the highest decrees in SCR um, uh, for the samples was in gypsum samples. And that was followed by beet lime. Control did have some decrees in SCR, but it was mainly gypsum and beet lime. And uh, this was again uh, significant. You could look at the numbers. For example, if I take gypsum, zero to 12 inch depth sample, the SAR level went from 44.42 to 7.26. This is a drastic, drastic decrease. If you look at the bead line again, the first 12 inches, 24.4 to six. So water can make a huge difference. Um, even in the second foot for the bead line as well as gypsum, this is, this is significant. Control also had some decrease, but it was not as significant as the other ones. And, but control at the same time didn't have very high levels in the first place. I also wanna point out, if you, if you look at this graph and go back to EC, Lindy, if we go back one more time, you will see the results are very similar. There's always a correlation between, if you decrease SAR, that means you lower sodicity, and soil particle aggregation would start happening again. There would be good soil structure that will help infiltrate more water. And in this case, we didn't have any shortage of water because we pounded the water at the surface. And you see there's a very strong correlation between um, sodicity and salinity because by virtue of making soil layers dense, sodicity actually makes soil salinity worse as well. So if you resolve that issue, salt issues will be resolved too, as long as you have low enough groundwater depth and plenty of rainwater. pH, um, you could see changing pH um, is a very long-term process and that is evident here. Um, even though you may see some differences in the bars, but if you look at the numbers, for example, in some actually pH increased a little bit that which could be caused by some of the carbonates and other, um, ions which, which uh, result in higher pH, but there was not a major uh, a difference, uh, difference in the soil pH compared to say EC and SAR. And I think we were talking the other day too, where, you know, I think a lot of people only look at the pH in a lot of circumstances. And, you know, in this situation, you can't necessarily look at the pH because um, it doesn't represent exactly what's going on. You really need to look at the EC and the SAR levels. Um, so our takeaway from this um, last section is water is very important. And I think we've um, pointed that out, um, that there's a lot of variability of what's going on out there and the environment plays the biggest role and um, a lot of that we can't um, control, but we definitely need that water there and quality water. Um, there is no, no noticeable differences really in the pH. And then out of the five out of the six samples, including the control, the EC levels lowered 60.62% to 90.01%. And then the reduction in soil SAR levels ranged between 39.64% to 83.65%. So that um, I'm glad we did that demonstration because I think um, it visually shows um, a really good takeaway there. So if you have any questions, these are our contacts. We also have a lot of resources, um, publications through NDSU Extension. Um, which Naeem, um, I'm not sure who is on those publications with you, but you guys keep those updated um, almost yearly, if not every other year. So, so they're um, pretty up to date. Okay, anything else that you would wanna add or? I would just say that um, if um, anybody has any questions, uh, like you said, uh, Lindy and uh, my contact information is uh, right there, as well as you know, if you're if you are in a different county, just co contact your ANR extension agent, and um, 
we'll we work together and we'll we'll try to find the answers for you. All right, thanks. Thank you.